Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Community Scale Composting Systems with James McSweeney. I'm Brenda Platt, the Director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative. And this webinar is one in a series that we offer to advance composting and share working models and tips for replication. As many of you know, we focus on supporting a distributed and diverse infrastructure for composting, as the next slide shows um, our hierarchy that we've developed uh, for how to reduce food waste and grow community, where you'll see, if you're familiar with the US EPA's hierarchy, you know, we start with reducing waste, rescuing edible food to feed people and or animals, home composting next, then we really care. This is the first hierarchy that we believe that's been developed that has this lens of small scale and, and keeping uh, materials local within local economies and communities. So we're really working in this part of the hierarchy, home composting, small scale, decentralized, medium and locally based before we get to centralized and certainly before mixed waste composting and landfilling and incineration. So the link there, um, feel free to go to that link. And uh, we have various versions of this hierarchy available, including a version that's been translated into Spanish. We're pleased to share that in May this year, we are convening the sixth National Cultivating Community Composting Forum. It will be in New York City, May 11th through 14th. If you're a community composter, hope you can participate. It's gonna be awesome. We're gonna have a full day training on composting with different uh, breakout sessions, full day of tours. We have four tours uh, or being organized in New York City of a variety of community composting sites and systems and sizes. And then we'll have two days of in-person networking and meetings. So early registration ends this Monday, so check it out. In addition to the forum, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance is convening a national uh, cultivating community composting, composter, excuse me, coalition. If you go to ilsr.org slash composting, um, you'll get to more information on our coalition, the Google group. We have many resources. Uh, this report we did on the left, Yes in My Backyard, a home composting guide for local government, we released last year. The one on the right, Community Composting Done Right, a guide to best management practices, we are actually getting ready to release later this week. So we're very excited about that. And I think that will be an excellent companion guide to uh, James's book that we'll be talking about um, today. We've done, as I mentioned, we've done a, this is part, today's webinar is part of a, a series of webinars we off, offer. Uh, these are just some of the most, a uh, sampling of some of the most recent. They're recorded, so um, check them out. Uh, the last one we did actually featured Rhonda Sherman talking about her report on, um, on vermicomposting. The one before that was on bike-powered food scrap collection. We had a spotlight on uh, equipment. Uh, the next slide shows how you might access those webinars if you go again to uh, ilsr.org slash composting. And on the right, you'll see composting resources. And you just scroll down to webinars, you'll see we have 13. And you can uh, just click on that and all of them will pop up. Um, uh, today, we're going to be talking about community scale composting um, systems with James McSweeney. His new book of the um, same title, Community Scale Composting Systems, is a 428-page manual for those wanting for those who want to compost food scraps on a small scale. James is going to speak for about 50 minutes or so, which is going to leave us almost 30 minutes for Q&A. In your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, there's a, it says questions. Feel free to start typing your questions um, at at um, any time, and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, before we get started, before James gets started, we're going to do a few polling questions just to get an idea of who's on the line and what you're doing. So um, uh, my colleague Virginia is going to run the poll. So Virginia, first question is we're going to ask uh, who's on the line? Are you government, nonprofit, private business, a community scale composter? Um, select all that apply or other. And I usually like to wait till we have about at least 80% voted. We're up to 75. 
All right, let's show the results. Uh, okay, good mix. So about a third nonprofit, a little less, not government, and community scale composters, 18%, and other. Okay, we'll have to find out you other category, who you are. All right, so where are you? Uh, East Coast U.S., West Coast U.S., Southwest, Midwest, or are you outside the U.S.? Looks like clearly most of you are on the East Coast, as you will all see in a minute. So 63% um, East Coast. All right, Southwest, we have some outreach to do. But for those of you outside the U.S., special thanks for joining us today. All right, so we want to get a sense of what you're currently doing. So are you currently composted? Co excuse me, currently composting? Are you interested in starting to compost? This is like on a small scale is our assumption here. Or are you, as like a government agency, are you interested in supporting community scale composting or do you fall into another category? Okay, we have almost half currently composting. Fraction interest in starting and a third almost interest in supporting. Okay, great. Um, and then the last question, and this is only for those who are already composting or you're interested in composting. So only for those who answer the, that. What best represents your location or site? Are you a farm? Are you a other business? Are you a school, a municipality, other? So we should have a smaller percentage of folks voting. Okay, James, you may find this interesting. Looks like one third are with municipalities, a little more than one third other. Small fraction schools, small fraction uh, farms, and other businesses. Okay, all right, thank you. So now we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce James. And let me just say, it's been a, I've known James for many years because he and I co authored a report, Growing Local Fertility A Guide to Community Composting, back in 2014 together. And he has been an ardent proponent and collaborator in the community composting movement in the United States for many years and helped plan the first national cultivating community composting forum in Columbus, Ohio. He is a consultant educator and author on composting. He has a background in agroecology and permaculture, restoring ecological integrity to local, local farm and food systems is so dear to his heart. Through his work at the former Highfield Center for Composting and current consulting company, his current consulting company, Compost Technical Services, James has worked with hundreds of composters, large and small, on everything from site planning, design and management to compost heat recovery and livestock feeding systems. And we're really pleased to have James today <clears throat> talking about his new report, Community Scale Composting Systems, which as I previously men mentioned is more than 400 pages. So James, we can see your screen and um, as you're going to uh, full screen, I'll just share that this guide covers a wide range of topics from system selection and sizing to site assessment and planning. He can't possibly cover everything today, but we're going to begin with a deep, a little bit of a deep dive. And so please check out his book um, if you want more information. So James, without further ado, you're on. Thanks. Thanks so much, Brenda. Um, um, and Virginia and everyone at ILSR for all of your amazing work. Um, and, and, for all of your support in, in getting this book out there. For those of you who don't know, know the book is is barely over a month old, So, um, but it's been over four years in the making. Um, and ILSR was supportive from the very beginning, so huge thanks there. Um, and, um, and happy spring equinox full moon, everybody. It's an auspicious day to be gathering uh, Composters here on the internet, and um, <clears throat> thanks so, so thanks so much for choosing to be here. Um, so yeah, uh, and this webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to scroll back through as a reference, and everything in here and a lot more is covered in my book. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right in. It um, the presentation here today is. Um, 
is really focused on concepts in site capacity and it's sort of organized into two sections. The, um, the first part introduces sort of this balancing act that facilities and whole regions are playing all the time in terms of constantly assessing and growing compost infrastructure and processing capacity um, as more communities start to compost and recycle um, organics. Um, and then we're going to talk in the second part um, just about some of the sort of the core concepts in compost system scale um, in steps that, um, that to take in your planning processes sort of um, it's it, what I call managing organics in space and time. Um, <clears throat> so, and oh, sorry, my slides are not advancing here. There we go. All right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this might sound a little strange, but this is uh, assessing and planning composting capacity is is actually a topic that I'm really passionate about. Um, I uh, have done a lot of work in this area over the years and 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 understand and, and well and, and frankly believe that we don't spend enough time talking about sort of the granular level of capacity from site to site to site and then adding that all up regionally. Um, and what um, I mean, as as cities and rural areas, wherever you're from, um, this is something that's happening everywhere right now. Is this infrastructure is 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 being um, planned and and put in place, and it's um, it's it's a process. So um, there is an ex has been an expansion of of composting, um, particularly food scrap composting. Um, from all sectors, residential, commercial, institutional, food processing, um, generators. And um, in general, there is more potential throughput, at least in more populated areas, than available local capacity, which, um, <clears throat> which for many sites um, is, is kind of creating this this challenge, which I call the, the throughput versus efficiency par paradox. There's as much material in a lot of places as anybody could ever want, but taking on too much material um, can very quickly um, over, over, overrun um, a site. And so planning, um, planning infrastructure is absolutely key in, in staying ahead of it. Um, in, in just sort of a general concept level here, um, you can think of a, of, a, of a compost site or any organics recycling infrastructure as a, as a pipe and, and there's um, raw organics in and stable compost out and it takes a certain amount of time for that material to stabilize and it takes a certain amount of, of space to process that material efficiently. Um, if you add more material, um, you either need to compost in less time or add more space. And where that space is unfortunately often added is on top of the other compost, um, which gets very inefficient and creates a whole host of, of issues. Um, so what happens when there's too much compost? Um, a, a, a number of things. Um, Overcrowding of sites can um, can basically um, make it so that it's impossible to access and manage material. Um, this this wouldn't be what necessarily a site that we would consider community scale. Although this you know this was all the leaf and yard waste from one community and a lot of of um, so this is sort of on on the larger end of community scale. Um, but this was a site that that that, that did get overcrowded and. Um, and they lost access or at least efficient access to that material. Um, and at the core of the piles, things can get really wet and they don't dry out. Um, 
it's harder and harder to manage infrastructure and keep sites clean, um, keep water flowing off of off of sites. It becomes harder and harder to maintain um, this material. <clears throat> and of course, if you can't manage material and access it, then the the challenge of nuisances or the potential for nu nuisances grows, and it can be. Um, if there is an odor issue or some other issue, it can be very challenging to remediate the problem um, um, in a timely manner. Um, one issue that that I face often is that um, the um, compost sites will go for the maximum available sort of uh, um, throughput level within sort of their, their regulatory options um, without much thought in terms of what the physical capacity is needed to, make, to handle that. And um, at some point, the permitted capacity becomes in people's minds their physical capacity, even though um, in some cases that's not even remotely the case. Um, and from a kind of a composting composters frame of mind, I, I um, try and remind people that sort of more material does not equal more profit. Um, it, it, it creates it can create inefficiencies when there's too much material. Um, that that um, having um, keeping things manageable is actually absolutely key to be being profitable and sustainable as a business and cuts out wasted time having to move things twice or um, s slow. Um, I, I missed, I cut out one slide earlier in terms of um, one of the problems is the larger the, the pile, the slower the composting process because air isn't making it into, into the material at that core. Um, nearly as efficiently. So, <clears throat> um, it's also, I mean, it's absolutely critical for composters to have a clear understanding of what their capacity is, what their physical capacity is, and what their target capacity is when um, creating a business plan, um, and 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 finding a logical scale that is is viable and i you know i think uh, i know everyone's on board with 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 composters being successful um and not pushing themselves beyond the boundaries of of what um <clears throat> of what's sustainable and, and that's to say you know we we really need to be focused in on that and not just incentivizing growing and growing and growing. Um, sustainability and sustaining an efficient scale is absolutely key to the sustainability of, of composting infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> so I also try and remind people that um, sort of value and quality um, and not the volume a, a site is processing is key to differentiating um, a composter in, in a crowded marketplace. So um, as more and more material gets, and this is especially true for at the community scale, high quality material, the, the value in terms of um, the community role that composters are playing is, and, 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 and that story, um, are absolutely key to kind of being able to differentiate a small composter in a marketplace where potentially material is 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 being produced at a rate that a small composter could never compete with. So, um, so you know, kind of carving out a, a, a space in the marketplace for um, and 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 selling that quality, marketing the quality and the community value. Um, so ultimately, this is about composters finding their sweet spot. You know, grow as you can, but um, but grow smart. Um, so I'm going to talk more about some of these uh, 
these concepts, a um, managing organics in space and time, as I like to um, joke. Um, let's see here. So this next section is really going to be talking about conceptual stuff in terms of site capacity planning. Um, I'm going to go through just some key concepts here. Um, so on the space side of of, of the space and time equation. Um, it's key to understand standing the bulk, what bulk density is. Bulk density is the weight of a, the weight of a particular volume of material. So um, oftentimes we're talking in tons of food scraps diverted, but what does a ton look like in space? Um, we have to convert it to volume. Um, and that's true, we can do that with just about any material. It's also a key concept in, in recipe formulation. Um, in general, food scraps have a bulk density roughly around 1,000 pounds per cubic yard, in my experience. Um, that's through weighing lots and lots of totes and loads on trucks. Um, that's as collected, so if you had nine 48 gallon totes, that would be roughly a ton, um, or four and a half would be roughly a cubic yard. Um, once that material's tipped on a site, it tends, and then if you were to pick it up with a tractor bucket, it tends to actually weigh more at that point per cubic yard. Um, so that's important to keep in mind, mainly for recipe development purposes. Um, um, for collection, for collection services that are washing totes and then tipping the wash water into the truck, that obviously adds weight and moisture. Um, paper products add bulk, so they lighten loads, sometimes considerably. Um, this is something that I always urge people to be measuring themselves and 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 um, getting your own bearing on what that is. It, it'll affect tipping fees at a compost site. Um, uh, both in and out of, um, both from the collection side and from the um, composter side, that really matters. Um, and food scraps do have a variable bulk density and, you know, meat adds weight, age adds weight. Um, <clears throat> and if food scraps are 80% moisture, which they, 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 again, they vary, but um, at a thousand pounds per cubic yard, we're talking about um, 96 gallons of, of water. Um, and, you know, so here's a, a couple of 55 gallon drums, a little bit less than that, but um, <clears throat> the target moisture content in compost recipes is 60%. So um, we need to tie up 25% of that, of the moisture in that cubic yard of, of um, food scraps. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, 200 pounds of water or so. Um, <clears throat> as this slide is not uh, all relevant here, but what I wanted to just mention is I'm not going to get into recipe development, um, but from the, um, from the, um, from the aspect of sizing, a compost facility, you need to have a, a rough sense of how many units of carbon and dry matter per unit volume of food scraps you're using. And, and that tends to be in the three to five parts range on a small scale and without meat, it can tend to be lower. Um, and with certain in-vessel units, it can be lower. There's there's a lot of variables, but it's a, it's a key factor to be thinking about um, when planning system capacity. Um, there's a there's a great video and some resources on my website um, about recipe development to kind of dive into it a little bit more deeply. But um, from a from a planning capa um, capacity planning perspective, we don't tend to actually necessarily need to have an analytically developed recipe, but it's good to have some ballpark assumptions. Um, and so, in my book and just in 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 my general, the way that I work, um, I tend to think about compost site flow and be designing um, capacity at each stage 
of the compost site uh, of the system. And I think about it, um, obviously there's Ross feed feedstock storage, there's a receiving and blending area that needs to be sized adequately. And then um, a primary composting phase, which is where heat treatment standards are met and where um, more active management is typically required in the early stage. Um, and then on to a secondary composting, which is where um, there's still a good amount of, of management, but um, um, but the rawest organics have broken down. There's still some raw material and odor potential. Um, and then beyond secondary, there's sort of a finishing stage where the piles are the piles cooling off. Um, and at the point of, of finishing, Oftentimes, composters are then curing, which adds value um, and, and quality to a end product, kind of like aging wine or cheese um, and storage infrastructure. And then, of course, any post-processing, distribution, screening, bagging, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, when we talk a little bit more about actual sizing of systems, this is the framework, this is the lens that, that I use um, and that I think about because at each stage along this, there's volume reduction, there's different aspects, there's different needs in terms of space. Um, and of course, now we're moving into, into the time part of the equation um, and composting, you know, time periods rage range wi wildly um, depending on who you talk to and depending on the site, but um, I should say widely, not wildly. Um, but in general, at least in the Northeast where I'm from, folks are, are making uh, compost, finished compost and even cured compost in six to 12 months. Um, again, this is very method specific. But um, I won't go through all the details of this of this chart, but it sort of gives you uh, give you a sense of sort of the range, like up, up the primary phase, two to six weeks, depending on the method. Secondary phase, um, and these all blend blend together to some degree. But this the primary and the second phase, secondary phase are what people would generally lump into the category of active composting. Um, and by the end of active composting, the, the temperatures are usually dropping down into the, you know, 115 range, something like that, um, uh, into the mesophilic range. Um, and <clears throat> so, you know, how this relates to compost facility capacity, you know, again, we just, we need to plan to have enough time and to manage the material um, properly within each of these phases. There's also something um, that we account for called the um, um, called the shrink factor or volume reduction. Um, typically, just blending food scraps with your other feedstocks will reduce the volume by as much as 20% with a with a um, a feed mixer or a TMR mixer which does a really good job of mixing. You might actually get slightly higher than that, but just bucket blending material blending with a shovel, you can easily get 20% um, blending, and I've, I've measured this, um, so I feel very confident in that. And then over time, um, there's obviously shrinkage that's happening as, as carbon is released, as moisture is lost um, through the decomposition process, and that's typically somewhere 20 to 40% in one to three months. Again, it varies, um, and I say here a sort of a total volume reduction of 60 to 65 percent. Um, it can be as high as 70 percent. Some materials break down, like food scraps break down to almost nothing. Yard waste um, can break down um, by as much as 70 percent. Um, manures, wood chips aren't going to break down quite as much as that. Grass disappears, paper disappears. So um, it's a, it's, it's, you, you can account for this shrinkage in your infrastructure. Um, so that's where this comes in. So in terms of site um, planning flow, the, the general sort of um, formula that I lay out in my book, um, this is fairly similar to what others are doing and what others have talked about is um, 
starting with sort of estimating throughput um, and sort of on, uh, on this sort of periphery, reviewing what regulatory factors might impact how much material you, you can or want to process on a site. Um, it can be sort of limitations where, you know, you, there are certain rules that affect a small site versus a medium site, and there could be reasons why a site would, would go one way or another, um, and that can impact a lot of things in terms of the site's capacity. Um, the next step would be calculating a batch size, and we'll talk more about sort of um, each of these steps. Sizing the primary, I, I recommend sizing the primary system and the secondary system, and then the finishing curing and storage systems separately because of that volume reduction that happens at each stage. Even if in practice it's all kind of melded together, it, it allows um, you to be slightly more precise um, in how you estimate that volume reduction and how you apply that vol volume reduction and also how you think about the space needs around the material itself in terms of access and flow of loaders, that sort of thing, roads. Um, and then of course, sort of sizing all these auxiliary infrastructure, um, feedstock storage receiving, blending areas, leachate treatment, stormwater management, that sort of thing. Um, so just gonna um, start here by defining sort of throughput. Um, I'm, I'm using the term throughput as sort of the way to describe the amount of material that's it's handled in and say a week or a short period of time as it's coming in um, versus site capacity um, might, might refer to how much material you're processing in a week, but it's also often used in sort of an annual, on an annual basis, but to get down to the, um, to, to really plan a site, we need to be thinking granularly um, on, a, on a weekly basis, at least, large sites on a daily basis. Um, and so I'm gonna run through a few different scenarios here in terms of estimating throughput. Um, so scenario one is is you know a certain amount of material can be delivered to you know there's a there's a hauler they've got a 10 ton load that they need to find a home for they're looking for a home for or you're uh, you are a grocery store and you know you know you have you're generating two tons a week on a regular basis this is sort of the simplest. Um, so these are two of the simplest scenarios in terms of kind of estimating throughput. Um, here's just an example. Again, a, a 10 ton per week um, load can be delivered to you. Um, scenario two is um, that you generate a specific volume of food scraps or intend to target a known list of generators. So again, this would be sort of the folks who are generating material on site or who, let's say, you're in a rural area and you've got um, you've got a elementary school and you've got a small grocery and a cafe and you know and three or four businesses and you can get a pretty you know you, you know who they are and you can quickly estimate how much material is coming from those or say it's a residential drop off in the town. Um, so in this case, um, there are ways of estimating food scraps that are generated by individual generators. Um, and that's in chapter 12, I, I've got a, I think I have an example here. Um, so here's an example of a university. Um, <clears throat> and what, what I did here was just kind of take three different, this is actually from another guide that, that um, Brenda and I are putting out soon called microcomposting. Um, so this example is in that. Um, and this is an example of a, let's see, what do we have here? Um, you've got um, a total number of students that, um, that Vermont's Agency of Natural Resources have. You have a, um, a generation factor. So in this case, it's 1.13 pounds per week per student. And um, and then there's two other different metrics that work similarly. Um, 
but just use slightly different metrics, meals served, students on campus, students off, off campus. So I sort of um, down here at, um, at the tons per week, you actually have a pretty wide range here that's, um, so so in some cases, it's it, this is actually a pretty inaccurate way to be estimating food scraps. And I'll, I will fully admit that it can give you a ballpark and some, some generation factors are pretty accurate, others aren't. But this often takes, um, I, in this case, I would recommend auditing the cafeteria and you know in the university to get an accurate representation um, of throughput. So scenario three here is that you have a, a, a target scale in mind in terms of how much finished compost you want to produce. And so from that target scale, you can back out the throughput that it'll take to create that. Um, so in this case, it's um, it asks the question, how much feedstock do I need to process? It tends to be two and a half to three times the volume of raw input for um, uh, um, as compared to the, the output, the finished compost you'd be creating. And um, and then of that raw material, how much 20, 20 to 25% is probably going to be food scraps. Again, these are just sort of based on some rough assumptions. Um, so the math here would be um, <clears throat> to create a thousand pounds of finished compost, gonna multiply that by 2.5, which assumes a 60% volume reduction. And we get 2,500 cubic yards of raw material per year. And then 20% of that's food, assuming um, assuming five parts carbon to one part, um, five parts sort of additional feedstocks to one part food scraps. And um, 500 cubic yards per year of food scraps, <clears throat> which is 250 tons per year or um, 4.8 tons per week. So Again, to you know, uh, so about five tons per week of food scrap throughput at, um, and then you know, multiply that by five in terms of the additional feedstocks should generate um, about a thousand pounds per cubic yard of, of finished material, um, and that that's assuming a sixty percent volume reduction. Scenario four is you've you picked out a site and want to know how much you have a potential site that you're assessing and you want to know how much material you could process on that site. This is probably one of the most common scenarios that I, that I, that I come across. Um, and so as an example here, we have a, a three acre site is identified. Um, the first thing that I would recommend is, is, is assessing, um, what permitting restraints there are, if any. In other words, how much of that space is permittable as active management area? Um, what are the setbacks from roads, from residences, water, that sort of thing? Um, and then based based on what would be per, per, um, permittable, we can use the capacity calculations that are um, that are specific to different methodologies, whether it be turned windrow or aerated static pile systems to, um, to compare different options. Highly recommend using a spreadsheet for this kind of so that you can capture all that and compare different things and, and change assumptions. Um, this is a place that consultants are often very valuable. Um, and then in scenario five here, you've got, um, <clears throat> you know, you plan to create capacity to serve as composter to a particular region or portion of a region's organics. Um, as in scenario three, this involves researching and estimating food scrap generation for the region, um, <clears throat> which, is a, which is a large task in some ways um, and, a, and a challenging task in some ways. Um, and, and, but based on that information, you can say, okay, these are the sectors that I'd wanna target. Um, <clears throat> 
and often it's a you know and i should just interject here that it it oftentimes there's sort of a combination of these different um scenarios so you might if you if you have a site you've identified it you've got a sense for what the capacity is now you go on to this step and say gosh is there that much material what are the what's the likelihood that you know i can even capture that much material or when when might i anticipate capturing this much material um, <clears throat> So as an example, you plan to provide collection composting services for commercial and institutional generators um, in the city. So that's, you know, that sort of separates out the residential sector. Could always add that later. Might be worth estimating what the residential sector would, would generate, um, which is a fairly easy calculation. Um, but Looking at sort of just the commercial institutional sector um, for a region, there are a few different ways to go about that. Um, more and more states have databases or you know or, or maps, uh, GIS maps that can help you in that process. The EPA uh, released the Excess Food Opportunities Map. You can find that online. Um, there, I wanted to recommend a composting collaborative webinar. Um, that was it was really actually helpful to me in in understanding um, how how much depth they sort of uh, went into in Portland, Oregon, as they were estimating um, the volume of food scraps and and the nuances to that process because it's I've been through a lot of these statewide databases and um, compared different numbers from different places and and I found it very challenging. Um, so, you know, they recommended um, really just the, or they really emphasized the importance of of sort of local knowledge in in getting a sense for um, regional volumes. Um, and then, of course, the final step would be kind of estimating what a capture rate would be of that generation in time, and 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 sort of. You can um, base your systems based, you know, in terms of infrastructure need based on maybe the first year, maybe the first three years, something along those lines. Um, so, with an estimate of, of throughput, we can now get a sense for um, what a batch is going to look like. Um, and so a batch is a material of like age that's managed as a unit. Um, it has a dis distinct starting point um, where incoming fresh material may be added to the batch and a distinct stop point after which no new material will be added, okay? Um, so this is a really key piece and um, I realize this is sort of, uh, may not seem relevant to anyone who's doing a continuous system, but um, the concepts still apply, sort of how much material and how much time does it need to process. Um, and a batch is um, your throughput multiplied multiplied by the sort of the, the frequency at which a batch is created, um, multiplied by the blending um, volume reduction factor that I described earlier, which is um, 20%. Um, so here's an example of 20 cubic yards of food scraps um, plus 80 yards of additional feedstocks. Um, and every three weeks, you're, you're creating a new batch, okay? So there's 100 yards a week times three weeks times the 20% volume reduction, 240 cubic yards per batch. You're starting a new batch every 240 cubic yards. Um, and so site design and assessment, um, as we move into the design phase, it involves sort of um, being able to um, conceptualize sort of what a batch looks like in space and time uh, um, based on the composting method that you're going to be using. Um, and what you want to be able to do as a compost site operator is to map, well, first you need to understand what the footprint of um, 
of a batch is. <laughs> and then you want to be able to see the site flow in both space and time. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But you want to be able to see this, uh, um, you know, a a grouping of material and say, that's three weeks worth of material, that's three weeks worth of material, that's three weeks worth of material. It really helps to kind of keep um, keep perspective on, um, on your site capacity and keep an eye on things. Um, so just an example of sort of mapping what the footprint would be. There's a lot of different ways to go about. This is just um, um, a an equation to, uh, estimate the volume of a windrow. This is in my book. There's a lot of there's there's a lot of information out there about sort of the calculations that say I have 100 100 cubic yards. If it's in a windrow, what's the footprint? What you know what what's the geometry? Um, and I won't go into that. But the on-farm composting handbook is another great resource. They they have a lot. They probably have the most sort of different um, calculations in terms of the geometry of compost piles. Um, but just here's an example of a turned windrow facility here um, that's been mapped out in space and time in this way. So this is, um, so you can see sort of to the left, there's a receiving and blending area. Um, and then just to the right of that, there is a um, the primary composting pad. There's three windrows, there's six weeks retention on that wind on on that pad um so i can assume that you know each windrow has two cubic uh sorry two weeks worth of material worth of worth of throughput on it um and i you know i designed this based on i think a, this particular um um layout based on that 10 ton per week or 20 cubic yard per week of food scraps 100 cubic yards of throughput per week and um, so I happen to know that sort of the assumption here was that the the, the three windows in the primary pad would actually get or two of them would get combined into one window on the secondary pad which is why you see three windows on the secondary pad but there's twice as much retention so you can think of, of each of the windows on the primary pad as two weeks worth of material each window on the secondary pad as four weeks worth of material and then um, I can't remember if they get um, they get <laughs> combined further. I think they probably do. But in the f finishing, curing, and storage area, there's 40 weeks retention. So thinking about sort of how much how much time we have and how much space we have is key to sort of this whole process. Um, you, you know, even in terms of there's eight weeks of, of feedstock throughput planned for. Um, for bin systems, you can think about it the exact same way, in, you know, in terms of primary bins, we might fill one bin every four weeks, and then we have another bin to fill, and then those two get combined into the second, into a secondary bin, which is slightly larger, but there's eight weeks, um, and then two more bins get filled to another eight week secondary bin so for a total of you know 24 weeks within bins and then materials would go out maybe into an open pile assuming that they won't be of interest to animals or be creating any problems at that point um, aerated static pile systems these are um, aerated forced air systems these um, can think of in a very similar way to the bins um, um, in terms of just sort of simple flow, um, because this aeration is typically happening only in the primary and secondary phases. Um, typically, a new batch is formed every one to two weeks, and um, the retention in that primary phase is about four weeks. And then it, sometimes material might get consolidated into the secondary, sometimes not. But um, typically, there's an additional eight weeks of, of secondary aeration. Um, and of course, this also involves sizing and designing the aeration system, which we won't get into. But that's there's a whole process to that. Um, just threw this in here, the extended aerated static pile 
um, systems design are really space efficient. So this is, you can see here how um, you've got kind of a windrow and then these wedges built off of that can fit a lot of material into a very small space. Um, in vessel systems, um, these typically come with sort of a rating, a vendor, a vendor sizing. Um, I always recommend that people in terms of thinking what their feedstocks are, understand what the recipe assumptions are, understand what materials they, they would like to use in their recipe because some of these systems assume that you're purchasing in a, a, a feedstock like sawdust um, or, or wood pellets that if you wanted to use another feedstock, that would certainly change the equation and it might end up reducing um, the overall throughput that would be a, um, that would work, which would speed up the retention time. So, and, and, and um, so likewise, understanding the assumed retention time, you know, um, this system was sized with, with 20 days. 20 days in InVessel seems to be a, um, a really good duration, but some are certainly sized for, for, for much less. Um, so you'd want to be able to take that into account in, in, your, in your planning and your assumptions about what, what, um, what comes out. Vermicomposting, I just thought I'd you know, put a note in here. Um, in terms of this is a continuous uh, fl flow bed um, with a two month um, retention time. Um, it's two feet deep, materials fed in on the top, cut off on the bottom, um, a 40 by five <coughs> footprint can process about a cubic yard per week. And, um, and, while it's a it's a fast process, it's uh, very space. <laughs> it takes up a lot of space. It has a, a high footprint. Of course, a very high value product in in, in vermicast. I mentioned earlier, just accounting for auxiliary in infrastructure. It's all of the supporting infrastructure, the feedstock storage, um, finished compost storage, roads buildings, that sort of thing. Um, think big, start small. So I'll, um, I, I'm a big advocate of, of piloting, trying new processes out, um, testing assumptions. And um, <clears throat> and just understanding that, that a site's capacity is almost never static. I mean, sites are often growing and and especially in those early stages, um, if a site has done the work to plan capacity up front, and then is as you're growing, you can you can kind of test those metrics and take some t test some of your assumptions, plug those numbers back in to see where that gets you um, as you scale up. Um, really valuable um, to to to, be, to have a feedback mechanism and. And as I was sort of describing, just being able to visualize, okay, this windrow is is three weeks or four weeks or ten weeks worth of material. That's the type of feedback that you can just have use on the fly. Um, you can certainly be gathering more information, um, say about recipe assumptions, that sort of thing, and plugging that back into your assumptions. Um, so looks like I do have time to get in. I, I left some slides for myself at the end, not knowing um, I, uh, I need to take a webinar about um, <laughs> about <laughs> uh, planning my, my webinar capacity and how long these things take. It's hard to know. Um, so, I, so I left myself this, this section here to go through, um, talk about some of the principles and rules of compost pile architecture. Um, so again, these are sort of out of my book, but I um, I kind of provide a little bit more example than I do in the book. So um, <clears throat> principle one here is um, so these are these are just concepts that can help using space efficiently is the main thing and processing material to the highest quality possible um, within that space. So <clears throat> um, principle one: taller 
taller piles fit more volume on less of a footprint. So here you have a five foot pile, a windrow that's 11 feet tall, or 11 feet wide, sorry, um, and it has 27.5 cubic feet of material per windrow. So it's just about a cubic yard per foot of windrow in a five foot tall windrow. Um, you add just one foot to that and two feet um, in terms of the, the base, and you've got 39 cubic feet. <clears throat> um, which is 18% um, more footprint this this six foot window is taking up, but you've added 42% more volume. So you can see, and, and that's just a one foot difference. Uh, the the difference as you, you know, if you say added three feet would be much more dramatic. Um, <clears throat> so the corresponding rule here is maximize uh, use of available space by increasing pile height without exceeding the recommended limit. So that's, um, we'll talk more about that next in terms of ideal pile height. So principle two, two here is as a pile's height increases, the surface area to volume ratio decreases. Um, so <clears throat> for my five foot windrow, we have um, 0.27 feet of surface area per cubic foot of compost compared to uh, six foot windrow, the, it's 0.23 feet of surface area per foot of compost. So it's 14% less surface area per volume. Um, and where, what that means is compost piles, at least static com or um, at least non sort of actively aerated compost piles require oxygen. Um, and, and the surface and the surface area provides passive oxygen flow. Um, so here's an illustration of that. So the so by ha having less surface area per volume, you have less passive aeration. It's, it's, it can create stagnation. Um, this also reduces moisture and heat loss from the pile. So larger piles tend to stay wetter. So if you're starting out too wet, then that's a problem. <laughs> um, if you're starting out too, you know, on the drier side, that might not be as big a problem. Um, but larger piles also tend to get really hot and, they, and they're more likely to overheat because compost is very insulating. Um, um, it also is much harder to add additional moisture to uh, a larger pile. Um, particularly just, you know, naturally through precipitation. So the maximum recommended height for a, a turn pile is, is seven feet. For an aerated pile is eight feet. Um, that's with a, a blower, a, a forced air system. Um, increased pile height to reduce moisture loss and maintain temperature. Um, decrease pile size and flatten piles to increase and distribute moisture. So that would be sort of creating that flat top so that moisture in, infiltrates if you want to, um, if you want to be adding more moisture. Um, you know, there's a, I, there's a lot of different opinions about what the right pile size is, um, but um, there's not much debate on, you know, the fact that larger piles tend to overheat more. They, they tend to aerate and, and, um, aerate less and, um, or require more management in terms of aeration. Principle three, I'm going to move through, through these a little bit because we want to wrap up soon. Um, so um, vertical piles such as cuboid piles fit 50 to 100% um, more volume in the same space and footprint as open piles. So here you have sort of a windrow versus uh, a bay. And you can see that there's, um, you can see how there's probably a hundred, you know, twice as much material fit into that, onto that same footprint just by adding walls. So the corresponding rule is, um, you know, when a site has reached capacity with open piles, use sidewalls to maximize the existing footprint um, through the use of vertical space. As 
Um, principle four here, as compost matures, it requires less oxygen to remain aerobic. So um, piles can be built larger, reducing the requirement for small piles. So, um, <clears throat> so here you can see sort of a, a natural progression on a windrow facility is leaving more space between windrows and so they can be actively turned as they're younger and as they age, they can be stacked closer together and combined and, and can go slightly higher. Um, still need to be able to access them though from the ends. So, so um, don't put them into a corner where you can't get to them. Um, curing piles um, can, uh, you know, I, I typically say eight feet. If a pile's finished, it's really not heating anymore, but it's just, aging and curing and if it's you know and if you're just really trying to store material for sale um you can go higher than that um piles can go anaerobic again if they're in you know if they're if they're still wet and so that's a that's a problem um for some of the sites that i've worked with just keep piling higher and higher in their terms of their finished product and it and and the piles never dry out, so they lose a lot of efficiency in terms of screening. Um, really, screeners don't work that well um, above 45% moisture. So it takes a lot of drying, and drying really requires smaller piles um, or covering piles. So keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> so triangular or um, Piles shed moisture, whereas flat piles absorb moisture. Um, I already kind of covered this, but peak piles to min minimize moisture, um, added precipitation or added moisture. Um, flattened piles to absorb precipitation. Um, in general, the, the base of a pile, the width of a pile is about twice the height of a pile, so just keep that in mind. These are windrows again that we're talking about. Um, and in terms of like the, the shrink factor that we were talking about earlier, um, what I tell people is that, you know, you really can only account for the shrink factor in your sizing equation if you're moving and consolidating that material because a windrow might shrink by 30%, but it's still going to be on the same foot footprint. <laughs> it's not going to shrink horizontally. So just kind of keeping that in mind um, in your sizing equations is what this principle is about. Um, so it really requires turning, stacking, combining piles to take advantage of that of that shrink factor. Um, principle seven is um, <clears throat> due to an increase in the biologically active mass. So the size of the pile, temperature tends to increase um, as that pile size increases. Um, in general, the recommendation is at least a cubic yard of fresh material to, to hit and maintain temperatures above 131 degrees, which is the temperature treatment target. Especially true in winter. Um, um, I, I threw this in here. Um, here you have an example of a of a compost pile that's hit the temperature treatment target. It's, it maintained 131 degrees or greater for it, more than three days and was turned five times. Um, this is actually um, a compost pile in my backyard, which had somewhere between a third and, and a half of a cubic yard. And uh, this is in the coldest part of the year. So I threw this in there just to contradict myself and say sort of <laughs> I, I'm, I am constantly uh, surprised at what can happen at a, at a small scale and at a potentially a smaller scale. Granted, I, I use a lot of carbon and I use a lot of leaves, which are very insulative. Um, so <laughs> and there's a few other tricks uh, that I use in terms of just like keeping the pile really vertical in my bin, but there's no insulation here. So um, so that's just to contradict my former point. You can definitely reach these temperatures at below a cubic yard, but more material does uh, help, as does insulation. <clears throat> 
Um, and finally, keeping, maintaining um, access for, um, for turning and movement of material is absolutely key. And this is sort of a good note to end on because this is, um, this is one of the biggest factors here um, that I've seen and what this, this, comp, this uh, presentation was really all about is sort of how do we plan a site that, that allows efficient movement of material, um, allows us to keep pile sizes within reason, allows us to move material around and manage it to hit temperature treatment targets and quality standards. Um, and um, so here you go. Here's an example of just sort of leaving some space in between the windrows to turn. These are fresh piles. They need a lot of management to hit temperatures um, and they require a lot of, of air. So we wouldn't want to be building these piles up too high. Um, so did pretty well on time. It's 3.05 and I think that that was my last slide. Um, so thank you, yeah. James. Yeah. Um, so we have plenty of time for some questions, so please uh, keep them coming. We already have a few. And I just want to say, you know, James's book, more than 400 pages, it includes, you know, chapters on different composting methods and technologies and how to do the recipe and the feedstocks. What he really did, I think, today is did a deeper dive on the throughput processing capacity, some of that understanding, because it is so important, um, as James said at the beginning, of under, that understanding capacity is so key to business planning and viability. So um, thank you, James. I think that was good. We did have some initial questions um, about, you know, community composting. But before we do the, comp the questions, I'm just going to have a few uh, closing polls and then we're going to dive into your questions. So keep typing them up. So we just want to get an idea of how you heard about this webinar. Um, did you hear about it through ILSR email outreach or our social media or James's own outreach? He reached out to pe people or uh, Patagonia did a Facebook ad for us or others. So just we would appreciate knowing how you heard about this. And it looks like most three quarters have heard about it through our, directly through our own email. So um, glad about that. Um, and uh, the next question, there's the results of that quick poll. Oops, I don't know if we saw that, Virginia, but um, I think I said. Uh, OK, so how after hearing James's um, this uh, uh, talk, uh, how inclined are you to start community scale composting, learn more about it, reach out to others to, for more information, or um, just to support and advocate for more community scale composting? So um, votes are still coming in, but it looks like supporting is very high, 70% support, and 40, more than 40% are inclined to reach out to other community composters. So you can see the results there. Um, we have to do more on getting you to start community scale compost, and we don't want to intimidate folks. So um, we'll be doing more of these. And then the last um, question as an intro to community scale composting and systems, just give an, us an idea of this webinar had too much information, the right, about, right amount of information, not enough. And votes are still coming in, but looks like the right amount of information is um, is got most of your votes. And for those of you who are selecting not enough, please let us know what you would like to um, hear more about because we do pay attention to that. So if you email us, we will pay attention to that. So we've got not as many people voting, but 67% said the right amount of information. Uh, 17 said too much and 17 said not enough. So, um, okay, so here now to dive into your questions. Um, the first question we had, James, was really about, uh, you know, your book and this webinar was billed as community composting. And uh, um, if you could just talk about the definition of community composting and it seems like what you talked about, um, the questioner asked seems more like medium scale municipal composting. Sure. 
Yeah, and this is a, this is one of the questions that a lot of people have been asking, and I and I and I um, um, I would definitely encourage you. I do cover this a lot in terms of in in the introduction of the book, but I um, I think how we define community scale is really um, is 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 really up to individuals and communities to define. Um, communities are at, are at all different scales, and so. Um, I, I certainly did not intend my book to be just for sort of micro scale or really small scale, but um, but rather to really focus on um, on the end use and the location in terms of managing material locally, keeping it locally, and that can happen at at all different scales. Um, and and where you know the the book really pulls from information that um, you know from on-farm composting, from biosolids composting, from um, from what's happening sort of at a at a, at a smaller scale um, and sort of on the grassroots. I tried to pull in and and kind of create a book for as broad an audience as I as I possibly could. But I think in in our work, Brenda, we've kind of defined community composters as sort of a self-defined community. Um, and, and so that's really where this was coming from. But I think, I, I think that all of these, all of the capacity, um, all of the past, the capacity sort of um, concepts apply no matter what the scale is. I mean, they're really all the same. That's true. And I know your book, um, the subject of your book said, you know, it's about handling organics at a volume above the scale of a single home and below the scale of a whole large city. So that's kind of wide. But in our, <laughs> uh, you know, guiding principles of community scale composting is really the radical notion that you're going to be making compost and using the compost within the same self-defined community, as James said, that's generating those food scraps and other resources. So it's closing the loop locally at a scale. So um, in the in the guide that James and I wrote in 2014, Growing Local Fertility, a guide to community composting, we had schools, farms, you know, urban gar you know, community gardens, urban farms, and uh, we even had um, people that were doing like um, a number of homes, um, you know, so get, you know, a number of households joining together to do it um, on somebody's property. So there was a wide, wide range. And what's uh, really amazing, I would just add, is is just that a lot of composters who start out on a really small scale grow um, and they keep that community element involved in the local element. And, you know, and these are folks who are who are building capacity for their community. I, I, um, so, you know, these, these are really folks, grassroots folks who are kind of paving the way in different regions. Um, so I really wanted to, I'm, I'm, you know, support that growth to whatever yep. scale they end up. Yeah. All right. So let's let's move on to some other some other questions. So um, we had um, we had a couple of questions on markets and and I don't know if this is beyond this the scope of your book or not uh james but uh we're in here's one quote we're in an urban area la there is plenty of input capacity but we don't know what to do with the finished compost where are some good places to send finished compost to is there much revenue to be made and then a related question from somebody else was um here in sonoma county so again in, in california we have more demand than supply for compost to achieve our quote carbon farming goals, so let's just see if you can. And if you keep your answers brief, James, we'll get to more questions. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's it's um, it's definitely something that um, is lo locally specific in terms of what markets are, but it's an area that um, that takes a considerable considerable amount of work in terms of and marketing the end product. Um, um, especially as 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 um, as capacity and as volumes of material that are being produced grows, um, it takes a lot of education. Uh, um, people don't necessarily know what to do with the material um, or with with compost. Um, so 
the, again, that's I did devote a whole chapter of the book to this. Um, but I'm, you know, it's an area that I, I personally want to kind of delve in more because this is this is an issue that comp more and more composters are sort of facing. Um, there are a few good resources. There's um, um, Ron Alexander's book specific to com uh, compost marketing and sales. Um, I hope that it's an area that organizations like ILSR and um, USCC and others are kind of supporting at this small scale um, because it's because yeah markets are going to drive this this stuff and I and, and the one last point is just don't undervalue your material don't I know that when you have a lot of material the inclination is to get rid of it cheap but don't do that um, get get a premium for it um, because that that will drive demand um, Yep, and I'll just share that, um, well, a couple things I want to say is do check out your local rules here in Maryland where uh, we do, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance does a lot of work. If you are distributing or selling, if you even if you distribute compost uh, for free, um, you know, it's going off site, you're not using it at your urban farm or community garden, then you have to have your compost tested and be registered. So just know what your local rules are. That's just one thing on marketing. But two, we have one of our community compost composters in our network, our fertile ground compost there in Oklahoma City. One of the value added products they do is these uh, compost filter stocks for stormwater management. Uh, we did a podcast with them uh, last year, late last year, uh, on our growing. A local power podcast so you can check that out and um, we'll send out some links to to those of you on the call and I'll try to get Ron Alexander's book out to you as well um, so um, we had a question this is just more technical about the actual composting process James what do you recommend to keep providing oxygen to piles that are in the curing phase that's a good question I in you know in the curing phase the oxygen demand is probably 5% of what it was at the, you know, during the active phase. So there isn't a lot required in terms of, um, in terms of, um, you know, providing uh, other than l keeping the piles small enough that they can breathe. Um, you know, and it, 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 that's sort of what we covered when we were talking about the different pile dynamics, but, but, um, but the, yeah, I mean, in general, the focus is on providing oxygen early on when there's <clears throat> when the microbes require a lot of oxygen. Um, if you know, if you had a really large pile and you really had no way around, you know, building a 10 foot tall pile, there would be nothing wrong with actively aerating it, and it could potentially even use that as a system to dry the material if that. Um, if that was needed um, and was beneficial, and um, it, but it would require very little little air, actually. Yeah, um, we had a few questions on composting paper goods, both biodegradable paper goods and just actually just mixed paper. And one of the uh, uh, questioners, you know, uh, prefaced their question with actually you know, sharing how the current collapse of recycling markets, particularly from China, is impacting local municipal programs. And so, you know, how practical is it to incorporate mixed waste paper into municipal composting programs since this is one of the materials with little recycling value today? Mm -hmm. And then another one, another person asked, can you talk about biodegradable paper goods as an input material? So you can address mm -hmm. both of those questions. Well, the yeah, so... Um... I mean, again, a, sort of on an individual composter basis, um, it's a question that everyone has to answer. Is sort of what what general materials they would they would be willing to accept. It, um, paper breaks down great. Um, it's it's a carbon it's a carbon material, and um, some people you know have pointed out that how great is it to get paid to take carbon? I mean, it's you know. Um, it, in in a lot of places, you're actually there's a cost to bringing in carbon, um, in terms of getting wood chips and places where carbon is is scarce. 
or or manure, bedded manures, that sort of thing. So um, getting paid a tipping fee to take in carbon, I think that the concern is um, is just the is the concern of contamination and sort of any contamination that might come along with opening the door to um, non-food materials. And so, you know, if there's a, um, <clears throat> if there's an ability to really provide a high level of education and keeping an eye on sort of, you know, how it's going in terms of, you know, by, by accepting paper products, can, will you, um, you know, will you see a higher level of contamination? Um, I think that that's sort of the, the question that, that I'd be asking as a composter. Um, but in general, I think some paper is acceptable to most composters. Um, there's, you know, been, there's been concerns recently brought up with the, um, the fluorinated compounds. So, um, um, the PFAS <clears throat> that I, you know, um, I hope will be resolved soon in terms of like the, in terms of the, the industry, the, the paper product industry and the compostable products industry. So I would just do some research um, as a composter on that aspect of it and follow it closely and um, make a decision um, sort of based on what level of risk I'm, I was willing to accept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add, you know, one of the challenges with having too much paper is that it can create these layers if they're not mixed in or shredded that block the airflow. So there's contamination, as James mentioned, but also just the, can impact the composting process. So it's a balancing act. Yeah, and this and some relates, of these smaller yeah. systems that have a lot of paper, it, there's, <laughs> there can be too much paper. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> And this relates to another question we had. Uh, someone is interested to know more about blending of input materials. Can mm -hmm. you say more about that? Uh, any machines that are available for this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and I mean, and just stepping back for a second, blending blending food scraps and other materials really makes a huge difference. Um, again, you get that immediate volume reduction. You get, um, it activates the pile. Um, I mean, in my backyard, as I mentioned, I blend everything and that, you know, and I hit in these tiny little piles, I'm hitting 150 degrees in the middle of winter, um, which I largely, uh, I think blending is a big part of that. Um, it, there's also odor, immediate odor reduction just by distributing the odors around um, and putting them in direct contact with, with carbon. Um, Tractor bend, blending or hand blending works really well. Um, the the on a um, on a larger scale um, and even on a small scale, there's total mix ration mixers. These are animal feed mixers. Um, j what's the name of the uh, Jlor? Jlor. Jlor makes sort of the smallest ones that I've found on the market. Um, they go all think all the way down to about a cubic yard, maybe two cubic yards, might be the smallest one, but um, they're not inexpensive. I think they start at around ten or twelve thousand dollars, but they get a really good mix, um, and then they go, you know, up, up, um, lower in lower in cost per capacity considerably as you get higher. They're often, uh, TMR mixers are often available used. You can get tractor powered ones. Uh, there's a composter up on the North Shore here in Boston that was that was driving their, uh, their TMR mixer with a Subaru <laughs> engine. Um, so um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, yeah, so TMR after we had yeah, yeah. After we had this conversation about contamination, a few more questions came in about this. One was, what type of contamination from paper products? I'll just say real quickly, I think what James was saying is once you start taking other municipal recyclables, then people might end up putting other things in. And so you're not, you could be opening the door for non-compostable products. But certainly paper as the fluorinated compounds on um, paper and other natural fiber compostable products. They're on there as grease resistance, by the way, like on a Jeanette paper plate or a bagasse, you know, clamshell. 
uh, and so they're almost all of the fiber-based uh, kind of food service where has been tested positive for this. So, um, and that's why the Biodegradable Products Institute at the end of this year, next year, there's going to be part of their standard for compostability and certification. So that's kind of a, something to keep in mind. Um, another person asked, at what stage would your infrastructure deal with contamination? And have you found good messaging to reduce contamination, given that so many guidelines are ignored? That's a great question, and a, and, and a tough one. I mean, yeah, I mean, composters I, are generally picking, um, picking trash at every stage, and then obviously dealing with contamination on, you know, on the back end through screening um, anything that they missed, but. Um, um, Gosh, messaging. Um, I mean, I, 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 I think that. Um, I mean, it's it, direct person to person is 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 the best, and 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 the the key is um, is being persistent and in dealing with contamination um, as soon as it occurs, and 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 sort of being re retraining so direct training in person um again you know this wouldn't necessarily be for the residential sector but um but having more direct communication is is better i i it's not an area that i'm that is i'm sort of more on the composting side than on the generator education side so um but i do know i've worked around the stuff enough to know that it can take multiple multiple trainings and uh um and and messaging sort of we, we you know sharing messaging with each other that's working i would strongly encourage yeah and i'll just add james that just to on a some examples is and i i think this is really important is if you are charging if you're a hauler and a composter just do not accept contamination. Reject loads, have a higher fee in your contract or agreement if it's got contamination, so they're paying for the disposal of that. We have one community composter network that just had an issue with produce stickers, you know? And um, and so they had this innovative thing where they gave a magnet for the refrigerator that had like 12 or 15 spaces that, you know, your family, your kids could put the pick off the produce labels and put it on the magnet. And if you filled up the magnet and you sent a picture to them, you got like a month off or some reduction off your collection fee. So think outside the box is just one point I want to make about contamination. But nip it in the bud. Because once you have people who are giving you contaminated stuff, guess what? They're going to continue to give it to you. Um, I know we only have a, a few minutes left, so I just want to um, wrap up with, um, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody's questions. Um, there was some on, uh, you know, nitrogen and um, uh, carbon and feedstock. Read James's book. Um, if you can, um, uh, one, what we have up here on the screen is, um, I just want to say we also have not only the websites for the signed copies and the Chelsea Green Publishing, but please don't order through Amazon. Uh, you know, uh, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, we do a lot of work on the problems of Amazon on many different levels, hurting local economies and independent bookstores. There's a great website, www.indiebound.org, um, and they that website will help identify local bookstores. And if you do need to order online, you can order online through an independent bookseller. So lots of links for you there on James's book. And it, We'll cover most of the questions asked. What I wanted to finish on was some of these. There's a couple of, I thought, really great questions about, you know, somebody wrote, I'm hopeful that composting is going to become a cornerstone program for community resiliency. Are my hopes too idle? idealistic, what are some of the practical obstacles to reaching this vision? And somebody asked, also asked on kind of a related uh, but different question about speaking to the issue of greenhouse gas production from composting. And I just want to, uh, you know, conclude by saying that community scale composting is really key to building community resiliency and in the short term, drawing down carbon from the atmosphere, helping us sequester it in the soil, 
and food waste recovery, reduction and recovery is now recognized as a key short-term strategy to deal to protect the climate and take action on the climate. And that's going to help us by 10 years that we literally need as we transition to a low carbon economy. So we do need to create the demand. We do need more information to set people up for success. And James, I think your book is just going to be a critical tool in the toolbox to helping, you know, on the path to that. And if you have any closing remarks you want to make in 30 seconds, please do. <laughs> Well, I you know, thanks so much. And I, you know, I, I, in terms of just quick roadblocks, I think the, the composter who asked the question from LA kind of hit, hit the nail on the head. Um, we've got to, we've got to be focused on the end use side on building demand for this material, because that's, what's going to drive this. Um, that's what's going to drive this movement. That's what's going to, that, that's what makes it sustainable at the end of the day is we need to be closing that loop. And that involves not just a focus on diversion, but a focus on, um, you know, on, on the whole, on the whole loop, all, all aspects of it. So thanks yeah. so much, Brenda. And thanks yeah. everybody for attending. Yes. Um, Thank you all for attending and uh, we'll send you information on our next webinar. Have a good rest of your week, everybody.